we'll start off with our panel. Um, Greg, you want to introduce yourself and your company? I will. Thank you, John. Good morning. My name is uh, Greg Tordowski. I'm president and CEO of Wayland Security. That's my role every day. My real job is I'm, I'm a uh, shepherd of a family asset. Um, my company, Wayland Security, is a third generation family owned business. It's headquartered here in St. Louis. It's a uh, contract security staffing service that today operates in 34 states, about 50 major markets, a uh, little more than 10,000 employees. Um, that's the big company. Then we started a smaller company back in 2010 that's actually headquartered up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, and that company uh, staffs stadiums, so NFL teams, Major League Baseball, professional soccer, PGA golf tournaments, and uh, Division I athletic events around the country. Um, I've actually got the fourth generation here with me today, so I may comment on that a little bit later. Jess? Um, I'm Jessica Ravello. I am CEO and co-founder of Arcadium. Um, started the business 18 years ago. Uh, we create interactive content and games, uh, primarily for large publishers. Do the games for the, the Post-Dispatch, amongst many others. Um, probably best known for creating the solitaire that comes pre-installed on 600 million Windows machines sold around the world. <laughs> so yes, I am personally responsible for about 200,000 hours of lost productivity. <laughs> <in this room. laughs> Mike? My name is Mike Dearberg, and I'm the chairman of the parent company of First Bank. First Bank is headquartered here in St. Louis, a uh, 100-year-old family-owned company. I'm the fourth generation. Uh, so we got started here in St. Louis, and now we're kind of roughly divided between St. Louis and the surrounding area and uh, in California, where we go up and down the coast from San Diego up to, uh, to Sacramento. Great. All right. Uh, Greg, why Evergreen? At, at what point in the history of your organization did you and or your family begin to embrace Evergreen principles? And tell us a little more about that. Yeah, Evergreen. Um, so next year, we'll celebrate 70 years in business, which is a big deal, right? And um, what I would tell you is that probably until maybe four years ago, five years ago, uh, our company was not evergreen. So it's been an evolution. It's been a journey. Uh, let me try to explain that. So uh, the company was founded back in 1949 by my dad's uncle. Uh, he was a taxi cab driver. And when he started the security company, the intent, actually the purpose of the company was to supplement his income as a taxi cab driver. Um, think about that. And then, uh, <laughs> right, and, uh, and then uh, the income from the security company eventually replaced the income from the taxi cab company. So it became full time. He died suddenly, passed suddenly in 1969. A really small company. Um, my dad, was thrust into this business, no security experience, no law enforcement, no military, but he had to figure out how to help his family, his aunt primarily. And um, so he joined in 69, and from 69 to 1989, uh, my dad grew this uh, great little local business, and it was really small. And my dad's purpose at the time, from 69 to 89, I have a tremendous amount of respect for this, this man, um, unbelievable amount of respect, actually. Um, but his purpose was to survive. Uh, his purpose wasn't to be evergreen. Uh, his purpose was to provide a better lifestyle for his family than he had been provided for in his generation. And uh, when we were going to school, uh, we were told that Wayland was not a family business, would never be a family business. And not only would it not be a family business, but family never work in the business. So figure out what you want to do with your life and get after it. And I did that after college, but had a drawing or, or, or a, a desire to get back uh, to work with my dad and thought I saw something, thought I saw an opportunity to help him grow. Didn't know he didn't have any money, I'll come back to that. Um, but anyway, I got that opportunity in 1989, 1990, um, and uh, I was able to use my dad's last name and I was able to use my dad's uh, customer base and you fast forward to today and his little company with roughly two million dollars worth of revenue and. 100 employees here in St. Louis is now what it was. It not, is now what it is, as I defined it in my intro. It's, you know, it's roughly at 250 with a run rate of about 275 million. It's uh, not 100 employees, but it's 10,000 employees. It's not a single market. It's 50 markets in 34 states. Um, I've got 8,000 competitors in the U.S. We rank number six, um, and out of those six, two are publicly owned, three are owned by private equity, 
Uh, so we're either the largest or the second largest privately owned company in our space. As I was along that growth path, uh, we were never intentionally evergreen. In fact, uh, the growth came extremely hard, extremely hard. I'm, I'm one of those stories where I was never home when my kids were young. I was on the road trying to build this business, trying to take care of not just my family, but my brother's family, my sister's family, and uh, really my mom and dad was the motivation, right? And, um, and then we eventually reached some critical mass. Uh, I was able to build an incredible team um, and all of a sudden, kind of the vision shifted, and it was no longer uh, an eventual exit strategy, but it, it became, about, uh, became about purpose, it became about people, and it became about opportunity. Uh, and that's how we became, eventually became Evergreen, like in our 64th anniversary or 65th anniversary. And, you know, the purpose piece is, is uh, because of the success of the organization, I've been given a gift, and, the, you know, the gift is the ability to try to give back and make a difference in a fairly significant way. And, and as the uh, business continues to grow, um, that opportunity will accelerate. That's uh, extremely important to me and it's become extremely important to the family. Uh, the people, purse, people part, there's, there's uh, two parts to that. One is this incredible team that I've built uh, that I feel um, compelled to, to continue to help them take care of their family and their future. Uh, and to create, op create opportunities for more pre-people like the existing, existing, existing team. And then it's also uh, the people piece is the fourth generation. So all of a sudden we have created this um, neat little company in our space. Uh, we fill a really unique position. Uh, what I haven't said yet is that uh, my market share, as big as we are in the space, is less than 1%. So my ability to continue to scale uh, just organically is, is uh, really unique. Uh, and, um, and my mindset is that um, that's a really unique opportunity for not just the business and the people who have helped me build it, but it's a really unique opportunity for the fourth generation, right? It's, um, you know, and so my mindset is, is an exit, which would be a significant uh, cash opportunity for, my, for me, for my family, and probably for the next generation, uh, has less appeal than the opportunity, the opportunity that is presented to create a legacy play with a fourth generation family business and, uh, and possibly beyond. So that's, uh, that's the opportunity piece as well. So uh, just really unique and, and really focused now on, on what this company might look like for a really long time into that young man's generation. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm thinking you answered all the questions I had for you. In that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but while everybody else is working, I'm going to have to work on that. So, so, so Jess, you're surrounded by uh, multi-generational companies on this panel. And as a G1, you've made it your mission to build an enduring company. What evergreen principles are driving your passion? And, and as a note, please talk about perseverance when uh, the Crimea was invaded and annexed. Oof, gave me a lot to unpack there. That's only one question. Okay, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, I think when I started the business, I didn't think of myself as a G1, because I didn't know what that meant. Um, you know, I just, I, I started the business uh, with my husband, so we are, I guess, a family business, uh, in 2001, uh, which was an awesome time to start a business. Uh, <laughs> Nobody wanted to talk to us. Nobody wanted anything to do with us. And I, I've come to realize what, um, what wonderful serendipity that was, because it helped me to, I think, go towards this evergreen path, which I didn't know existed at the time. Um, and, uh, and the reason for starting the business really was because I was living in this crazy 1999-2000.com uh, .com world at the time. I was working for a company that had done a reverse merger and blown through about um, Sixty million dollars in capital in uh, I think a year and a half. It was just a, it was a you know scooters in the office and dogs and craziness. It was that it was that two thousand craziness. Um, and as a as a a really arrogant twenty five year old, I said you know I, I think I could do a better job running a company than than this. Um, and plus I didn't really see the opportunity um, as a woman at that time to be able to stay on a path where I could build an amazing, thriving, exciting business, um, and yet 
be a engaged, loving, present um, mother. Um, and so I said, well, if I can't find this in any other business, I'm just going to go and build it myself. Um, so I think that that was you know, part of um, the, the beginning of my evergreen journey, although I, I probably wouldn't have called it that at the time. Um, but I'll spend a little more time on the second part of the question, because I think that's the, most, the, the more interesting one. So what John is referring to is um, I bootstrapped the business, um, didn't take any, uh, any, I took VC investment 13 years in. That's a question for later on in the conversation. Um, and so bootstrapped the business, and as a result, um, uh, started, couldn't pay myself, couldn't, couldn't, pay, uh, couldn't pay anyone. Um, and so uh, with an initial $2,500 investment uh, from my 401k, uh, started hiring developers outside of the United States, eventually hired a group of developers uh, in Ukraine, in southern Ukraine, and grew that from uh, a group of six to eventually a group of 100. And uh, fast forward, uh, doing business there, bought an apartment there, spending a lot of time there. Fast forward to 2014, um, that region of Ukraine was invaded by uh, the Russians um, and subsequently annexed by the Russian government. Um, so we spent the entire year basically going from being a, uh, a wholly owned sub-Ukrainian company to a Russian company, um, which really sucked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to put it lightly, uh, you know, lots of things happened. My bank account vaporized, and you know, we probably lost about six months of productivity with people waiting in lines and changing papers and, and all of that. But we, we stuck with it because we didn't really have a choice. Um, and then, uh, so we thought we were kind of getting by. And then um, in December of that year, um, the, uh, the Obama administration sanctioned the region, um, which essentially made my business uh, illegal that day. Um, uh, couldn't speak to my employees, couldn't pay my employees, couldn't get code in or out of the country. Um, and this was over, over Christmas. Um, so another sad Christmas story. Uh, I don't think I was. I, I don't think I was as uh, held it together as much as it sounds like you did. Um, so uh, so yeah, went from um, essentially yeah, had to make a decision. What are we going to do? Right? Are we going to shut the business down? How are we going to persevere? Um, and uh, and eventually uh, made the decision that we were going to um, basically take everybody that was willing to go, um, and and move them and their families. And so we moved um, 55 out of our 100 employees um, out of uh, Crimea, out of southern Ukraine, or what was Russia at that time, um, about five hours away into mainland Russia, which was not under sanctions. Um, and that was a, a real difficult time. Uh, it's become a defining moment for the company. It's become probably my single greatest um, moment of, of, of value, because I think when you're tested, you really understand who you are, and that's when your values really mean something. Um, so we went from 150 people to 75 people overnight, essentially. Um, it came very, very close to going out of business. Um, but we're on the other side of it now. <laughs> and it feels great. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you have a... Uh a grandchild working in the business, they'll remember that, and that'll be kind of a touchstone stone of, of the business. Uh, Mike, um, talk about your former we're not for sale advertising campaign and how that not only described your intent to stay private, but also plays into your purpose. Great. Well, so I'll, I'll come back to the advertising campaign towards the end. I want to start with, uh, you know, as I was Listening to Dave, I was thinking, you know, so I'm, I'm new to Tugboat. Uh, this is my first meeting uh, this week. And so what Dave was talking about, about, you know, the perspective of venture capital, that is so foreign to me. Uh, it's not only foreign to, my, to me, to my family, but it's also, frankly, foreign to most of the, and probably all of the clients I interact with. So we as a bank, we're, you know, we're focused on uh, serving the needs of family-owned and, and privately held companies. We also have a retail side serves consumers, but we are really growing our focus on family-owned and privately held companies. Uh, and so I do get to spend a lot of time with them, but I can say that they're not thinking that way either. Uh, and it's not to say that they are all 100-year companies or 200-year companies uh, or that they'll make it that far, but 
Uh, they're certainly not building, you know, they didn't start it to sell it. Um, and I'll say just, you know, from our own personal experience, uh, it is very much at the core of who we are that we are not for sale. Um, this is something I think it was in our milk cartons as I was growing up. Uh, you know, this company, this is going to be family held uh, forever. My dad really uses that term forever, and he really, I think he means forever when he says it. Um, and, you know, he's done everything he can to set it up so that it is that way. Uh, and whether it's, you know, instilling the value in us, uh, whether it's doing things from the trust standpoint, um, you know, so for example, it would take a uh, unanimous vote of the children, my, myself and my siblings, uh, in order to make that uh, switch. But I guess the other thing too I would say is on this being privately held, uh, is that my dad, he's not the kind of person who would uh, ever use the term stewardship. Uh, that's not really the term, he doesn't use those kind of terms, uh, but it's very much, uh, you know, at the core of how he's thought about things. And so he explained, it wasn't until recently that he explained uh, to me, uh, and we actually have recorded this on video so we could share it with the company, uh, why the company isn't for sale. And essentially he told the story of how, um, you know, the, the family's story of, so it's, you know, it started in uh, Creve Coeur, Missouri, not far from here, suburb of St. Louis. Uh, it was essentially mom and pop bank uh, all the way through the 1960s. My dad at that time held a, you know, basically a fractional interest in a mom and pop bank. He also owned a fractional interest in a mom and pop grocery store by our same name. Um, and so um, at that time, he had done pretty well. He had invested in the stock market, done very well in that. Uh, and so he wanted to go into banking, wanted to buy out his relatives, and they were all very supportive of him going into the business. Uh, he made it clear he didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to do it. He could do other things, um, and he didn't want to do it unless he, you know, uh, had the control, the reins, um, and, and the equity. And so the rest of the family sold to him, and they got a, a, a fair price. But I think from his standpoint, it was clear to him that they probably could have gotten more had they done a strategic sale to some third party, something like that. But they wanted to keep it in family hands. So for my dad, uh, this was a, a big deal. I mean, that he, having received it this way, I mean, having bought it essentially that way, uh, it's not for his to sell. It's something that he is a steward, uh, that he's taking it from one generation and passing it on to the next. Uh, and that, that value, although he's never really used that term stewardship, uh, is very much at the core of who he is. So, um, you know, I said that, you know, I don't talk to people, know people necessarily in the VC world. In the banking world, there is, there are so many of us out there, uh, a lot of banks and they're continually getting bought out. And so, especially before this downturn, there was a lot of churn. And so we actually had billboards in St. Louis that said, we're not for sale. That was, I think it just said, we're not for sale. Uh, and I've heard people say that that was the best marketing campaign we've ever done. Uh, I'm not sure quite how to take that. Um, <laughs> you know, we have an amazing marketing team. Uh, so, but I think it was, it was powerful in that moment. Uh, we don't have those billboards anymore, not because it's not true, but because um, you know, eventually these marketing campaigns kind of lose their luster. Um, but I would say, so f for us now, and I think, you know, um, whether you're a commercial client um, or on the consumer side, I think people have kind of gotten used to all this M&A uh, and their bank being sold and sold again. Uh, so it's probably not as important anymore on the customer client side. Uh, I think it still really is important on the uh, yeah, as an employee of the company, I think it really is important to them that this is a place they can start here and they can continue their journey through their career at First Bank, and that's really, uh, you know, important to them. So it still really is important to us, and I think we've taken this just focus on be not being for sale and really, uh, through the help of organizations like Tugboat, uh, started to take it to another, you know, level or direction of there are all kinds of benefits that come from being private. Uh, we see that in our clients. We see it in ourselves. And so uh, we're, we're trying to seize that and take advantage of those opportunities. Great, thanks. Uh, Greg, um, you have a rather unique workforce uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. Um, how, how do you communicate evergreen values and principles uh, within your organization? Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really unique workforce, actually. Um, you know, I tell people uh, at, that, at that lowest level, the 10,000 security officers who work for us across the country oftentimes are 
unappreciated, disrespected on a daily basis, but um, their job is to protect billions of dollars of infrastructure, billions of dollars of assets, uh, millions of lives, and for that they're grossly underpaid. Um, told the tugboat group over the summer that uh, not only are they grossly underpaid, but that employee population uh, has been ranked uh, by Forbes magazine on an annual basis as a security officer as the most unhappiest career in America. Uh, so that's the employee population I have and told the tugboat group also in June that we aspire to be on the list of um, 100 best employers, whatever the, the list is. Um, I think that's Forbes magazine as well, right? Um, yeah, so communicating with that population, John, is, is, uh, is just really, really difficult, especially when they're dispersed across the country. So uh, we really focus uh, not necessarily on just communicating with that population, but the way we maintain our culture of a family-owned business spread across the country is, is to communicate evergreen values and really the values of my family through our branch office structure uh, and making sure that we have leaders in those branch offices and in those regions who um, understand first what my family's about and, and, uh, and our expectations. Uh, then that kind of manifests itself into the business and then filters down uh, through those 10,000 employees. But it's extremely difficult. We had uh, Wayland people helping us with parking uh, at Enterprise and, and uh, at the Arch last night. And yeah. I, um, they're all connected to you because I was talking about you when I walked in. So. Yeah, just, just one more comment. If you think about these evergreen values, evergreen principles that are on these flags, and there's one up there that says people first, uh, chances are that most of you in the room who own a business, work for a business, chances are within your organization you, you'd mention or you'd say that your employees are one of your greatest assets, right? It's a very common theme. Well, what if your employees were your only asset? That's my business model. My employees are my only asset. The only other asset I have in the business is uh, goodwill associated with contracts. Uh, and my contracts are all cancelable for no cause within 30 days. So my entire business model is dependent upon low wage, unskilled, uneducated labor uh, who have that responsibility that I just defined before. So the, uh, the theory of employee engagement uh, the theory of servant leadership are truly alive within the Wayland organization. Jess, <clears throat> I, the way I've looked at it, Arcadian, Arcadium is both uh, pragmatic innovation and pace growth on hypersteroids. Talk about how you and your team engage uh, together in discussions on innovation and growth. Yeah, so I, I'm a big believer in systems and processes. And, um, and so, you know, our mission is to reinvent content. Um, and so we are constantly challenging ourselves to, um, to innovate. And I think that if you just leave that to chance, um, you may get lucky. Uh, and some of us get lucky and some of us don't. Um, so you, you really have to build it into your process. So um, there's a couple things that we do um, to make sure that we're constantly thinking about innovation, we're constantly working on innovation. Um, so for one, we have, a, we have an event twice a year uh, called Jamcadium. Um, it actually grew out of the idea, you guys may have heard of, of game jams or hackathons, it's something that tech companies do. Um, it grew out of, of that and, um, and we basically pause the business um, every single one of our 100 plus employees um, spends two and a half days um, in new teams and in new places. So we send people from our Russian office to New York, our New York office uh, to Russia. We actually reseat um, so we can have a different perspective even if we're in the same office. And we work on uh, small teams of about five to eight, um, people we normally don't work with or interact with on a daily basis. And, uh, and those teams are tasked with coming up with uh, either the products of what could be in three or five or 10 years from now. Um, and beyond that, uh, not just the products, because when you, when you only focus on products, you tend to over-index for engineers, um, but also uh, things to make the business better. Um, so people who are in operations or people who are in marketing or people who are in people innovation, um, can say, you know, I've seen this in the business and I want to make it better, but I've never had the time to think about that or I've never had the perspective from other people about how to make that better. 
Um, so we've been doing that for uh, probably about seven or eight years now. Um, and a new product that we, that we just introduced um, is a result of that. A lot of innovation inside the processes in the company um, are part of that. Um, so that's something that's just now become, I guess, part of the DNA of the business. Um, and um, I'm going back to one actually next week, so I'm very excited about it. Cool. Uh, I have a perseverance question for you, Mike. The, the Great Recession was like a 500-year flood for many banks, particularly ones in real estate and mortgage. Uh, what were some of the key lessons that, that First Bank learned, and what was your family able to do to help your company weather this calamity? Well, we did learn, learn a few lessons during that uh, time period. Uh, so one of them is, um, what does it mean, what does long-term mean to you? What is, how, how long of a period do you need to think about as a family-owned business? If you want to stay private forever, you want to be around for the next 100 years, what kind of outlook do you need to have? And so during, you know, prior to the downturn, we had um, you know, groups around the country, California here in St. Louis, that focused on uh, residential, uh, you know, home builders essentially, um, and you know, I think we thought it was an acceptable risk, uh, in part because the statistic that we heard uh, all through that time was that the residential market had never gone down nationwide more than one percent since the Great Depression, and that and that you know phrase you know since the Great Depression it hadn't gone down more than one percent sounds you know like you're in a safe place. Um, the problem is um, that actually during this great the Great Recession. Uh, it was worse than the Great Depression. That, that from uh, peak to trough, uh, there was a greater decline in, in home values. So we just didn't, we had we needed to include the Great Depression as part of our mindset. Uh, and I guess the you know, funny thing is, you know, so when John and I were we met to talk you know, before this, uh, and John uh, was referring to uh, the Panic of 1873, right? Which I, I you know. <laughs> I had to look up, um, <laughs> you know, I, I sort of vaguely aware that there were these the panics prior to the great, you know, so uh, you really have to think long term. So this is now ingrained. I, I feel like I am institutional memory to the company, uh, having gone through this, not wanting to repeat it. Uh, I'm going to do everything we can to make sure that we are not going to repeat it. Um, and so making sure that people throughout the company have this perspective of everything we do needs to be. Uh, done in a way so that if there is another 100-year fl uh, flood, 100-year event, uh, that we're going to be able to survive it. Not just the typical recessions, but really severe stuff. Uh, another one, and, and I think there's, we have too many lessons uh, take all day, but uh, I guess another one uh, is on, constant, on uh, diversification. So diversification in a, in a family business is an interesting topic because I think, uh, you know, let's say most of our clients um, the vast majority of their wealth is in that business. So by default um, or, or definition, as a family-owned business owner, you are not diversified. Uh, and so that makes it really difficult. Uh, for us, and I mentioned this, you know, our, the work we did in um, uh, lending to home builders, you know, it was like 15 to 20 percent of our loan por portfolio at the time. You know, I was, uh, you know, 30, 35, that, you know, around the time we were making some of these loans. It didn't, that, that number didn't strike me as being high. It turns out that was really just too high. Uh, and so concentrations are part of what uh, burned us. We're, we do everything we can to make sure we're managing through concentrations um, so that as a bank, we're as diversified as we can be. Uh, but on the, on the flip side, um, one of the nice things about, my, and I mentioned before my dad and how he was a good stock picker. He's been a good stock picker throughout his life. He's continued to do that uh, so that the family has never like not since the 1960s have we taken a common stock dividend, um, but we have additional resources outside the family. So during the downturn, we had this outside money. The one we weren't worried about, you know, uh, food on the table, thankfully. Uh, but also, we actually, you know, reinvested in a major way uh, back into the company, which I think provided some confidence to the market, and you know, just did a lot of good things. So having that, um, you know, the rainy day fund, I think, was really important to us. Uh, I guess maybe this last one I'll mention is values. Uh, so in a, in a prior life, I was an attorney. Uh, I worked at a bank regulatory agency. Um, I did actually enforcement actions against bankers and banks. Uh, so I saw the sort of flip side of things. And what I saw was sometimes when things went south, um, the, uh, the bankers would act in ways that you wouldn't 
want to see people act in with bad values. Um, and that's a, a quick way to get the regulators working against you. Uh, so fortunately, during the downturn, our leadership, and we've had a non-family CEO since uh, probably mid-2000, mid something like that. So our, uh, our CEO at the time was great about making sure we were transparent, making sure people in the company knew what was going on. Uh, we were upfront with the regulators about what was going on, uh, and so they supported us. So maintaining those values in a, in a difficult time, that's when you're really tested, uh, I think that's, you know, hugely important. Thanks. Hey, don't, don't you all worry about the panic of 1873? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, talk about uh, evergreen values and competitive advantage for uh, your organization. Yeah, uh, huge advantage, actually, not just evergreen, but um, the, the, uh, the family piece as well. Uh, I've done just the opposite of what Andy Taylor told us to do over the last two days. So instead of not hiring from competitors, I've been able to hire from competitors. And to put that in perspective, so all of the growth has been organic, uh, but we acquire talent. Um, uh, and to put the talent in perspective, my vice president of sales and marketing came from a company called Securitas. And when I hired him away from a company called Securitas, Securitas was number one in the US, number two in the world. At the time, I was probably a 75 to $100 billion company. He chose to leave that role in that job uh, to come help me and my family. My senior VP of operations um, came from a company called G4S. G4S is number one in the world, number two in the US. When I hired him, um, he was uh, the number three person in the US operation, actually North American operation for, uh, for that organization. Senior VP of field support um, came from Allied Universal, who is currently the number one provider in the U.S., probably today number three in the world. Uh, this gentleman started the government services sector for Allied Universal, which is a multi-hundred million dollar um, operating unit, and ran their largest region. And, and all three of those gentlemen, I keep going, all three of those gentlemen came from those organizations to join mine, when, when all three, when we were less than uh, 100 million in revenue. and. Um, and they left because they bought in primarily to Evergreen and uh, Evergreen principles and, and the um, uh, fam unique family business culture. They were able to leave these large bureaucratic organizations and help an entre entrepreneurial firm take advantage of an opportunity that had pr been presented in the industry and they were able to join an organization where they could truly affect change and make a difference as opposed to uh, working for the, these large multi-billion dollar organizations, either publicly owned or owned by significant private equity, uh, where their job was to make a difference, but they really weren't making a difference. Uh, it was just a role. So uh, just a unique ability to recruit, number one. Uh, number two, there's also a unique ability to sell. So uh, there are three companies in my space, used to be four, uh, that control 53% of the market. There are 7,900 and 97 of us who compete for the rest. Um, I don't compete with the rest, I compete with just those three. So all of my growth, 95, 96% of my growth has come from taking market share from companies owned by private equity uh, and or the publicly held companies. And I made the comment over the summer and make the comment often within the company um, that growth doesn't come easy, but when you're competing against publicly held companies, when you're competing against companies that are owned by private equity and you're privately held uh, with a long-term perspective and you can be really patient, growth comes really easy. So we've been fortunate enough with, with some of these principles to over a 30-year period have a compound annual growth rate of close to 18%. Uh, and as we get bigger, the growth rate's accelerating. So this year, all of a sudden, it's 22 to 24%. I mean, it's just cr kind of crazy what's happening as a result of being privately owned, truly privately owned, but competing with publicly held companies and, and their value system and, and private, or pub public, uh, ec private equity companies uh, and, and the way they do business. The disadvantage is that we're privately owned and, and, uh, and we're family owned as well. So it plays against us in that uh, when we're competing against those three companies, they're quick to say, well, we're gonna buy them. They're the next ones for, they're, they're, they are the next one that's for sale. So that's the downside. Put up the uh, not for sale sign. Not for sale, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, so Jess, let's kind of stick with 
with that area, and, and we'll ask the VC question. You know, talk talk about you know getting rid of the yoke of the VC and and wanting to create an enduring company. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and keep it fast because I feel Spencer's laser eyes <laughs> boring through me. Um, so uh, so I think I briefly mentioned we we decided to um, to take our Series A 13 years into being in business, which is pretty atypical for a technology company. Um, it was a minority investment. We, we were privileged enough to have built the business to um, the, the, the size and scale where we didn't have to, um, we didn't have to, to lose control or take a majority uh, stake to get the investment. Um, and I was telling Dave, I think probably a couple weeks ago, that you know, joining um, the Tugboat Institute, I, I had built the business with these values, but never maybe um, knew what they were or, or had um, vocalized them or written them down in a way. Um, and then I read that article with Elizabeth Holmes on the cover. And I immediately called Dave and I said, oh my god, this is, this is what I've been doing. I didn't know other people were doing this. Um, lo and behold, that had been about two years after taking this VC investment. And so I think that um, that was kind of a defining moment for me in, in spending time with this group and understanding what this, this movement stood for. Um, really made me, it was, it was kind of another one of those moments where you, you look at your values and your integrity and you have to make that decision. And, and for me, it was very clear that, um, that we could not be, we couldn't stand for all of these things um, and have this, uh, even though it was a minority stake, have this, uh, this partial ownership that I, I think was, was zigging while we were zagging. Um, so, uh, so set upon a path to um, to continue to build the business and 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 put away money and and not have any debt. And I'm happy to say, about a month ago, uh, we bought our investors out of the business. Um, yeah. So, thank you. But I, I also feel really lucky to be able to, um, as a as as a result of that, really be able to to speak with some credibility about both sides of what it's like because I have lived. I have lived through um, having that VC investment, um, and now having not. So, um, so I'm excited to to start to share that with people. Cool. And, and Jess pointed out to me earlier, she's the only tugboat member from New York City, which says something about the culture there. But you can uh, <laughs> you can spread the word that. Uh, <laughs> so last last question, then we'll go to audience questions. Um, and it's a shame because. I'd love to have you hear about Mike's family's plan for a 250-year winery you know, plan, but we'll, we'll skip that. You can ask him about that later. But talk, talk a little bit about how your dad kind of prepared you for um, you know, your evergreen business, um, and then talk about some of the things you're doing with your younger kids and thinking ahead to uh, making them either good operators or good owners? Sure. So um, I started in the business. I was a teller. I had all sorts of roles. Uh, and I think my, my dad encouraged us to do that. He never, uh, he never pushed us into the business or said, you know, this is what I want you to do. He wanted us to be happy doing whatever we're going to do. But uh, certainly giving us the opportunity to be in the company, get exposed to it. Uh, there are certain things he thought that might be beneficial to us later in life it, were we to choose to go into uh, the business. Uh, including uh, uh, a legal degree, so I did that. He matched my dad uh, went to law school as well, never practiced a day, but he thought it was really beneficial. So I did that, ended up practicing law for a while. Um, a lot of things that he taught, you know, I learned by by being with him, hearing how he thought about things, uh, and really him, th you know, leading by example, uh, his integrity, things like that. I mean, he he doesn't talk about it; he just he just does it, uh, and so I think that's. That's really how I learned from him. One thing I would say is when I, you know, when I was in my 20s, I mean, I was very interested in these sorts of topics, but we really struggled uh, to find anybody to help us. Uh, so I'd be asking questions about how to, how to preserve things long term, how to make sure you don't, you don't screw up your kids, uh, all these sorts of things that I'm sure a lot of you guys wonder about. We really couldn't find great resources uh, on this. Um, so I'm very fortunate within the last couple of years uh, since returning to St. Louis, we've, we've found that. And so just as an example, to give another plug to John, I mean, I was here in the audience, um, you know, uh, I got, what, two, three years ago, two years ago, uh, listening to John and another panel 
uh, talk about their business, their journey. Uh, and so I'm very active in, in sitting in audiences and, and talking to their families to understand how they do things. Uh, so one of the things I picked up along the way uh, is, you know, we have, I have two boys, um, 12 and 13. My sister has five kids. So we're trying to get them interested in the business, um, not, again, not pushing the business, but just set them up so that whether or not they are going to be active in the company like I am or just be a pat, you know, an investor in the company, an owner, that, they're, that they have the skills that they need. Uh, one of the fun things I could pass on that we did was we set up an investment club uh, for um, our, you know, essentially the three oldest children, um, and that's been amazing. So my dad, again, uh, he, he's still active trading stocks. Uh, it's a great way to pass from my dad to the next generation. Uh, some of this knowledge, uh, we, we've brought in a, a guest speaker to talk about uh, the insurance industry, what's going on in insurance. We talk about all sorts of things. We have a little um, slight uh, bias towards bank stocks uh, to help them understand that. But it's been fun for them to interact. Um, so, you know, just it depends on the kids, obviously, but our kids have really gotten into it and embraced it. And it's been a great way for them to develop teamwork. Great. Thanks, Mike. We'll open it up for questions. So thank you. Uh, I, uh, we're a first generation, and, and uh, we had similar experience when I read that article. I was like, thank God something like this exists, because we're from out west. Um, we're from Colorado, and the, the mentality is very startup. And, um, and it got me thinking, like, my, uh, my wife's grandmother is from Cincinnati, and she refers to Procter & Gamble as Procter & God. Um, <laughs> And I think that there was a generation of companies that spoke to that generation, but we need, I think, also a new generation of companies. But um, what's intriguing to me is that, you know, 6% of companies generate 50% of the profits in the U.S., and only 4% of companies actually get over a million dollars in revenue. And so as I hear, you know, being with Andy, uh, you know, yesterday hearing your story, you know, four generations, it was a different time in terms of how much, like, you know, I think the story I've heard now is banks like to lend money to people who don't need it. Um, and, you know, it's no, um, I think, um, surprise that you had to take VC money because I think to build a long-term company these days, it's very difficult to find um, capital that aligns with those values. And, and so my question is basically, maybe to both of you, is for those of us that are, you know, um, trying to build long term, but are starting this generation with a, with a different structure of, you know, a financial reality. Where do we find the sources of capital that can align with what we're trying to do? And I think the, a logical response sometimes is, well, just grow without capital. And I think my response is, breathe without oxygen, <laughs> because you need capital to grow. And so, based on your experience, like, what would you have done differently? Or could you have done anything differently? Oh. I mean, that's a really good question. I think sometimes when I look at that paced growth thing, I think like, oh, <laughs> that's, that's like, I am very paced. <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, for our business, we were very, very patient. Um, and that allowed us to, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't grow at 20% every year. We're growing at 20, 25% a year now. but. Um, there were many, many years where we were flat and some years where we were down. And I think that um, there is a trade-off there, right? Um, and especially being in, in my business, um, which is very much a hit-driven, high capital-intensive business. I mean, you think of um, the candy crushes of the world and the fortnights of the world. Um, you know, when I hear you say you have 8,000 competitors, I'm like, oh, if I could only have 8,000 competitors. <laughs> now, there's like 10 million apps in the app store, literally. Um, so, um, you know, I don't think that I would have done anything differently because I think that everything gives you the opportunity to learn and become better. Um, but yeah, I would be lying if I said we wouldn't have a different, um, we probably wouldn't have, we would probably have a very different, um, revenue outlook and if we had taken on more money, you know, um, and and I guess I'm okay with that. I don't think I'm really answering your question because I don't think there's a good answer and I think that that's why this this movement is, uh, 
is something that I'm very interested in because I think that first we have to kind of educate people that there is another way that you can build a business and that it is viable and it is not less than, um, and then the investment will come. And I think uh, all of us believe who are, who are in Tugboat and who are evergreen companies that we are the best positioned for when, um, for when the economy does turn and we know that eventually it's going to happen because of the, of the way that we have, um, that we have um, grown our businesses. So we're going to be in a great position when that happens. Got time for one more? Hard to, to get you. there. <laughs> so my question is for Greg. And uh, Greg, I have a very similar business that is a low wage, underappreciated remote workforce. I think at the end of the day, family businesses in general, turnover is very expensive. Um, and retention is an important measurement. If you could touch briefly on the things you have done to invest in the recruiting, retraining, culture building, et cetera, of, of your workforce and how that's improved your you know, measurability of your retention rates, your financial impact, those kind of things, because it's, it is a big focus that you need to focus on and it's often a, a secondary thought and it, and it requires money to be you know, invested before you see the return on investment. That's a big question. So uh, the talent piece right now, it's a talent war, right? Um, and it's really hard. It's uh, like Elena said earlier, um, I'll back up, I'll add some levity. So I like crime, I like unsafe communities, I like the threat of domestic terrorism. <laughs> you want a recession too? <laughs> and I pray every day for a recession and I want it really deep and I want it really long because I need labor. <laughs> Right? And I keep growing. I'll, I'll grow right through it because it doesn't impact demand. It might impact cash flow, but it doesn't impact, uh, impact demand. But, um, you know, unemployment rates are at 50-year uh, lows. Who knows where they're going? Um, inflationary wage pressures uh, in the low-wage market is like a runaway train right now. You can't keep pace with it. Uh, in my case, I negotiate contracts, and if I go back to my customer base multiple times during a year, it's a real serious problem. Chances are the contract's going to bid, um, uh, and it's immediately put in jeopardy. So what we did uh, about two years ago, or what I did, because you could see this coming, right? I mean, you knew it was coming. So I invested a significant amount of money uh, in building a centralized talent acquisition center, which I'd never had before. Um, and it's a team of, of um, really neat people, actually. Uh, they all happen to be young, don't have to be young, but young, well-educated, and all day, every day, they're doing nothing but mining for talent, uh, trying to fill the funnel, and then the bottom of our funnel is really tight, so it's, a, it's fairly selective in this low-wage market, which, which is also difficult. Uh, so that's how we're creating volume, and it's worked so far. The fear is what happens if unemployment rates continue to decline. Uh, and labor, all, it's not gonna evaporate, but all buts evaporates. Uh, so that's, um, that's a really, really, really serious concern as we move into the latter part of 19 and 20. Um, that's, how, that's, that's when I lose sleep or how I lose sleep. Um, the culture piece is all about, uh, you know, it starts with uh, we've got a really robust onboarding program. Uh, so we pay a lot of attention and, and invest a lot of time and energy into what it looks like at that lowest level when somebody joins our family, is what we call it. And then I work in an industry that um, the turnover rate on the permanent side of the business in the industry is 200 to 300%. So think about that with an employee population of 10,000 spread across the platform. I mean, it's a, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a recruiting and retention um, it's not a nightmare. We call it a beast. It's a beast. I mean, it just keeps coming at you, um, and we do the best we can. But you know, I don't. I don't have a silver bullet for it. Um, we, our retention rates are, retention rates are uh, significantly better than the industry, but still very high. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks for a wonderful panel.